Hi, uh, I'm David Lurie. Uh, welcome back. We put a series of videos uh, online here for people. If hopefully they're working for you or helping you in one way or another. I know uh, we can't we can't um, we can't help everybody, and that's uh, part of the deal here. Uh, so this week um, I lost a really close friend of mine. Her name was Christine. She's from Los Angeles area, and um, And there's, uh, there's, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. Uh, she took her life last week, and she was in, she was a part of a certain fellowship uh, with me, and she had shown me so much kindness whenever I visited California after uh, I sobered up, that uh, you know helped me get around to places where we meet and things like that, and uh, I just, I just want to say I'm. Uh, her friends out there and, and her family, I'm sorry. Like, uh, I'm really sorry for your loss I, and for our loss. You know, uh, the day that she was found, I was uh, basically told by some friends and I, uh, it hit me really hard. It hit me really hard. And I know part of it is because I really was close with, with Christine after spending like lots of hours in traffic, driving to and from meetings and the beach and and stuff, uh, yeah, it hit me really hard. And, and part of it is also because we lose so many of us, right? Like so many of us, so many people, whether in recovery or out of recovery uh, to mental illness, uh, symptoms of mental illness, whatever it is that, that, that puts us in that spot. Um, having been in that spot a few times before where I attempted uh, to take my life, um, it, it's hard to describe it, right? Like, it's hard to describe that place. And that place just, I guess the best way I could say where I was, because I don't know where Christine was or where other people are um, when they successfully take their lives. Um, I was just flat empty, right? Like empty. And you wouldn't have known it by looking at me. My life was pretty full, but I was empty. Uh, and... I, the more I isolated, the more I withdrew from my family and my friends, uh, it was because I knew that my family and my friends would want me to stay, right? So what I naturally did was pull back and back and back and, and through doing that, uh, almost seal my own fate, right? Like that was the idea. Uh, now I don't, I don't know, uh, obviously, Christine's medical history, I have no idea. Um, I just, I know that from what I, her and I had experienced together, uh, we both uh, followed some similar pathways uh, in terms of our, our lives. Um, so anyway, I, I just want to go through this. This has been on my mind, and then when I, when I learned about what happened to my friend, uh, this became more uh, essential to me uh, for whatever reason. Uh, people are described the uh, relapse prevention and suicide prevention, obviously, in their own languages. Uh, however, uh, we get that point across. The idea is, is that when we're managing our life, okay, on a day-to-day -day basis, now, obviously, I'm going to assume a little bit here that you may already have an idea of a program or you know that there might be something wrong, maybe it's a mental health concern or... Something along that nature. So I'm kind of assuming that. But if you ha don't have any experience, I'm also going to take a little time to try to put it in the first, like the first time you're thinking about it, and just talk about it in a way that, um, well, at least I found helpful. Okay. And uh, I'm not suggesting that what we're going to talk about is the be all and end all, or even that I use the proper language at the time. Uh, really, the idea is is that. We are trying to control our triggers, okay? So if we try to control our triggers, chances are the triggers just get worse and worse and worse, right? So what we have to do is learn how to address those triggers. Try to manage them as best we can. Now, there are certain absolute things we can do to try to control that. And, the, and usually that means completely isolating and separating ourselves from all people, right? Like that, that kind of isolation, however, is exactly what these two things want. Okay? They want that isolation. They want us to pull back because once we pull back, then we're left to do whatever it is 
that is we're obsessing about in terms of these things, right? Um, obviously, in my case, and I'm not speaking for everybody, but I had to pull back from my friends and family enough that they wouldn't be suspicious um, if, in terms of how I was talking, right? How I was speaking about um, wanting to be here, uh, being excited for things, you know, because I, I knew what people wanted to hear. I, st I still have an idea sometimes what they want to hear um, when they ask you how you are, right? Um, because sometimes if I were to tell you how I am, you would be concerned, right? And, and maybe rightfully so. But the reality is, is that sometimes I feel that way all the time, right? And I don't do anything about it. Now, part of why I don't do anything about it, okay, is I have a lot of privilege. That's part of it. I am privileged to have a family that didn't, um, that wasn't deathly toxic, right? I, I'm privileged to have friends that are also a part of um, a movement to help people not get here. If we can, if we can, right? Now, obviously, once we've attempted or we've relapsed, it doesn't mean we have to give up, okay? I'm gonna say it again, because it's not a moral issue, okay? There's not a moral issue if you relapse or if you attempt suicide. You're not morally wrong. Um, I think, as time goes on, I get a little bit more punchy with, um, with some of the bigger religions, right? And how they claim to know how people should live and how people should die. And, and in my mind, I don't, um, I just don't think that's right, right? I, I don't think that as humans, we have any right to tell another human why they should or shouldn't be here. Because one of the things I'm learning every day, it seems, more and more, thank God, because I need to, is just how uneven the playing field is for all of us. Okay? that we're not all on the same starting point. Um, and I, I, obviously, I, I've known this, but like as time goes on and, and the current situation, I don't want to go back to sleep and be ignorant about that. So that applies to why people attempt suicide, why people might relapse. If I get in the way and assume that I know everything about this stuff when I'm talking to people, I'm going to miss them, uh, potentially miss them, right? Just like... Uh, they'll p potentially miss me if I'm not open enough in my approach. And what I mean by that is accepting the fact that, you know what, for some people when they attempt suicide, it is absolutely the only right answer for them. Not for me, from my perspective, but for them, from their perspective. Because that's something I can tell you with certainty. When I attempted, I did not in any capacity imagine it would hurt anyone else. And it wasn't because I was stupid or ignorant. It's because when I was at that desperate moment, okay, you have to understand what comes hand in hand with that desperation is a complete lack of self-worth, self -worth, okay? A complete lack of value in my own life. So if I have a lack of value in my life, how am I going to imagine my family has value in my life? I'm not right? We've been through that story over and over and over again. And this starts to tell the difference between um, severe depression and being sad, right? Now, sometimes we can be really sad and want to die, okay? And maybe people who are really sad attempt to take their life because that's as sad or as heartbroken as they've ever been, right? I cannot judge that, and so I won't, right? And so I won't say she shouldn't have done what she did. I won't. I loved her absolutely as a human, as my friend, right? But I don't know what she should have done. I don't. But what, we're, what I'm doing this for is because just in case you're out there and you don't know what you, you can do, maybe this will help, right? Just, I'm going to try not to go too long because I'm sure you're tired of me talking already. Um, so we're just going to start by looking at what is our environment, okay? What environment... Um, are we putting, what environment are we putting ourselves in? So you think about that, but backing up the truck, okay, because I got a little bit ahead of myself, which I do, because I get excited about talking about things that are terrible, right? But that need to be talked about anyway. And so anyway, here are some contacts. If you're starting to feel triggered by this video, like right now, that it's okay, okay, because we're talking about this hard thing, and maybe you just lost somebody. Right? I, I sat in the grief as long as I felt I needed to. And it did. It absolutely incapacitated me early in the, right after finding out. 
There's no question about it, I needed to do that. So if you're in trouble right now and you need help, please call 911, okay? Before you do anything else, if you feel like you need emergency help, like you're on the verge of taking your life, please call 911, okay? If you're in, uh, in need, okay? If you feel like you just need someone to talk to, and that might make the difference, try the distress center. Now, I'm not saying that these numbers are the be all and end all, but these are some of the numbers I can give you right now, okay? So distress center, 403-266-1601, and that's in Calgary, of course. Now, obviously, 911 is pretty much North America, I think. I'm, I'm not sure of any state or province where 911 isn't the emergency number, okay? So that's why I give you that one first. Also, Alberta uh, Mental Health Hotline, for if you're in Alberta, 1-877-303-2642, and that's Alberta Health Services um, Mental Health Hotline. It's toll free, so you won't get charged for the call. Uh, that's in Alberta. Now, if you're not in Alberta, or maybe you're not in North America, if you, if you need help desperately, please call whatever emergency number you have and ask for whatever resources you're looking for, okay? And maybe, hopefully you'll get some help if you don't know what else to do, where you are. Uh, check with your provincial health service if you're in Canada. Uh, in the States, very complicated. I don't know anything about it, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, I know most of it's private from what I understand. But it, whatever, wherever you happen to be, just reach out to somebody who might know. And that comes to the fellowship, okay? If you've already been in the fellowship and you understand that there's people you can call any time of day or night, um, please start reaching out to those people because they might know the numbers that I have no idea about. Same with family and friends, right? But one of the things that, we, that I have to do if I want my family and friends to, to help me, I have to be honest. I have to be honest. And that is the hardest thing to do. I, I'm not going to lie to you. The hardest thing I, I have done, one of the hardest things I've done, is look my doctor in the eye and tell him I'm not sure I'm going to make it if he doesn't help me. That was hard to do, right? And I, I get it. It was fucking hard. Um, I had spent 13, 12, 13 years, no, 11, 12, 13 years telling him I'm fine, right? Because I didn't want meds and I didn't want all this stuff. And then finally... Uh, as life is known to do, uh, it, it humbles us and puts us in a position where we can either go backwards and I could do what I'd always done, which is try to kill myself, which in this being of clear mind and sober, I imagine I would be successful uh, where I failed before, right? And I didn't want to do that. For whatever reason, I had enough people around me to show me that I was va like valuable, but not give me my worth but allow me to recognize it for what it was, right? So anyway, that's, the, that, that's just leading us into the environment that we're putting ourselves in. So ask yourselves, where are you? Like, where are you hanging out? Who are you hanging out with? What are you doing with your time, okay? Um, and what activities do you engage in, whether healthy or unhealthy, right? But let's just take a look at the environment we're in. So, like, for example, where do you spend your time? Are you hanging around a bar and having trouble not drinking? That, that would be a very simple solution right away if you were to move and not go to the bar. That's one thing that you could eliminate that might help you. Obviously, and if you haven't relapsed or anything yet, um, these are important questions beforehand, right? Where, what are you doing with your time? Who are you giving your time to? Okay? What we put in our mind and, and what we put in our, in our bodies affects us. It affects how we think, how we sleep, how we act, the words we say, it affects us. There's a biological connection to each one of these areas, right? Because our mind, that environment is really what I'm thinking of, and some people might break it up differently, but your social, your situation, okay? What is your social, social situation like? Like, do you have a lot of friends that, that know nothing about you, or do you have a few friends who know everything about you, right? Like, these things are important because if I have a lot of friends that know nothing about me, I'm gonna keep that going. Because then I can compartmentalize with each person different stories about who I am, right? That's, that was what I tried to do a lot of when I was drinking and using. And of course, getting to, attempting to take my life. 
Okay? So, but this is also suicide prevention. Because where am I? Who am I hanging around with? Am I engaged in behaviors that are going to make me more likely to feel worse about myself? Right? So that's the thing. I have severe depression. I always feel bad. <laughs> okay? I, I generally always feel bad about myself. Okay? Almost all the time. There's very few times in a day where I don't think poorly of myself in some capacity. What I've learned to do though with that is I, I try to spend my time bringing things into me, like my mind and all that kind of stuff, um, that is not going to push me further down the abyss. Right? What I'm doing to bringing into myself is I'm trying to bring stuff in that will, if not get me into the light, keep me at least from that darkest dark. Okay? I can live in the dark for a while. It's not a problem. I've spent most of my life there inside my head. But the idea is I don't want to spend the rest of my life there <laughs> because I know that on a long enough timeline, I'll take my life there. The dark is too much for me to bear, right? Because I'm already filled with dark is how it feels. Okay? So anyway, what am I doing? What activities am I engaging in? Am I engaging in uh, um, esteemable actions? So that's how some of the things we, one of the things we say when we're working with new people, okay, is what, if you want self-esteem, do esteemable things, right? So we can't expect to, um, if I'm doing, if I'm doing like, I don't know, shady shit, right? If I'm doing shady shit, I'm not going to feel good. I can't feel good that way. Right? Not if I want to live a principled life, which is what I'm trying to do because what I've experienced is that the more principled and disciplined my life becomes in terms of a spiritual practice and whatever, okay, the less difficulty I have with living, which is really a big deal for me because most days I have a huge problem with being alive, right? And I don't know where it comes from in the brain, what is in there, okay? So I want to make sure I am checking who I'm with, where I'm going, like, where am I spending my time? If you're spending your time in a bar, chances are eventually you'll drink. It's quite possible if you're an alcoholic. If you're not an alcoholic, then you probably don't have to listen to that, right? But it'd be the same idea as if you go to um, a crack house to have coffee, okay? Chances are pretty good. The coffee sucks, if there is any, and you'll have to eat it out of the car, but, right? Like, that's terrible. So we don't do those things if we want to get better. Right? We just have to kind of, there's some things we have to separate from. Now, does that mean you can control all of the triggers out there? No, like I said, you'd have to lock yourself in your apartment and go nowhere and do nothing and have no relationships, right? Which is not human either, okay? Humans, we gravitate towards people. I see it everywhere I go. Even with the COVID and the distancing, we still gravitate towards each other. And it's ridiculous. <laughs> If you ask me because I'm an introvert, I think it's ridiculous, right? But we do. We gravitate naturally towards, towards each other because we're not islands. And I do the same thing. I gravitate towards people that I care about, like absolutely, right? So mental emotional. Now, you can break this stuff up however you want. Like what are your persistent thoughts? What are your obsessive trigger thoughts? What are the, what's the obsession that goes on? What do you do to regulate your cognition and your emotional states? Like, do you have anything um, besides maybe um, what I used to use, drinking, drugs, sex, work? Like, do you have anything to help you regulate, like properly regulate? Properly just, I'm just saying it like healthy, in a healthy way, okay? So there's not like a right or a wrong way, it's just a healthy way. Are, are we using do we use healthy things to regulate our cognition and emotional states, or do we use unhealthy? Am I using um, drinking to deal with my like inability to balance my emotions, that kind of idea? Or am I meditating? Because you can do that too, right? And it's the other side of the coin a little bit. Uh, sometimes it's in the same thing. One of the things that happened this, after I found out about my friend was, of course, I, I then started to meditate. Like, I needed to meditate. I, I had nothing else I felt I could do. And the meditation, I think I, I think I won the one day, I stayed in it for about an hour, and all I did was just sob, right? But that's what I needed to do. And that's, if that's what you need to do, I encourage you to do that. So what are your alternatives to cope with triggers if what you're using isn't working, right? 
And if you're wondering how this ties into suicide, uh, then just take a look at this and think about the fact that if you have suicidal ideations and they become obsessive thoughts, then what are the triggers that trigger those thoughts? Like what, what makes me want to take my life more on one day than the next, right? And of course, like most humans, it's the normal things. It's the normal disappointments that they seem like they're exaggerated by a million when they happen if you're in a, a depressive state or if you're drinking and using and trying not to, right? That those, those things can be huge triggers, okay? So what are your alternatives? Do you have alternatives? Do you have people you can call? Are there places you can go to connect with other people who are like you? Have you ever thought about getting involved in a group setting with depression? Or if you have schizophrenia or bipolar, like, have you thought about those things? Are those things available, right? Um, or if you're, if you're right presently suicidal, like, um, can you simply go and talk to somebody honestly about it? Is that possible? And if it's not possible, how can you make it possible, right? Because I don't assume that everybody has the same access to information anymore. I just can't. So how can you do that? Who do you need to ask? The big thing here is remembering that our sick mind cannot cure itself. Cannot cure itself. So all of these, all of these ideas um, work better. I'm not saying they don't work at all because there's always anomalies and thank God for that, right? But some of the, most of these will work way better if you can work with somebody. Like talk to somebody about it. Get this stuff out in the open. Because first, is make sure it's somebody you can trust. Please, I, I, I sh I'm not telling you to run out and tell just anybody because the idea of that is terrifying to me. We need to make sure that we're safe. Right? And that is the first and foremost thing when we're telling someone, which is oftentimes why we never tell anybody. Right? That's, that's also why sometimes it's nicer to call a, a government number that's like completely indifferent to who we are so we can just tell our story. Right? And that's what I did when in the, over the holidays when I had the closest I've been to suicide since I've been sober. Right? I just had to call somebody just to get out of my head. Right? I didn't tell them who I was. I didn't tell them anything about that. Okay? Um, examine the stories you've told yourself about how you're feeling, about what you're using to cope. I think at any stage, examining the stories we tell ourselves is vital. Right? Because I'm going to believe some of those stories that I've been telling myself for 20, 30 years. Right? Versus something that's brand new. However, what if the brand new information is 100% accurate and can help me but I'm not willing to look at it because of what I'm holding on to, okay? So this isn't about saying everything we've thought is wrong. This is about saying some of what we've been taught and what we've learned is not accurate, okay? I'm not assigning malice to the people who taught it because I'm assuming, just like us, they didn't know any better than what they knew, nor do we, until we learn it, right? So. I'm not assigning blame or anything like that to anyone. This is simply, if you're going through this and you figure out there's some stuff that you might be able to do to just simply make it a little less shitty, right? A little less shitty oftentimes will keep me from that like end result, from putting my foot on that ledge, right? So, hey, physical. What are some physical things that are going on for you? What's your health like? Are there complications from drinking, maybe eating, and all of those things? And we're gonna, as we get down here, we're going to talk about um, something else that happens with, uh, with different addictions like eating disorder, okay? But what are our habits for, what's our health like? Okay, how are you feeling? Are you exercising, okay? Are you taking medications? Are you supposed to take medications, but you're not taking them, okay? So off, we're gonna take a minute to talk about medications just for a second. I'm not telling you, obviously, one way or the other whether you need them, I don't know. But what I am gonna say is, if you're getting on medications, oftentimes it takes a while for them to either stabilize inside our system, sometimes six weeks, it's awful, because that first six weeks, all you feel are the side effects, 
right? And then, of course, if you stop taking them, what you feel, if you stop taking your medications, what you end up feeling are the side effects of the medication leaving your system, which can take weeks, okay? So we're gonna just pause right there and think about it. Are we on medications? Do we need to take them? Have we self-medicated? What are our habits with medication? How are we keeping ourselves there? Um, yeah, so think about that and yeah. So we talk, we talk, we're talking about medications and now we're gonna talk a little bit about exercise, okay? So what, what are we talking about in terms of exercise? Are we talking about rigorous cardiovascular and resistance training? Maybe. Or maybe we're talking about taking a walk, okay? Instead of sitting for another hour or whatever. It's simple stuff. We don't, we don't need to make grandiose plans anymore because what we're really trying to do is stay present, okay? And stay grounded long enough that we can feel ourselves balance out a bit. So our, when our body and our mind are depleted of things like, um, like proper nutrition, okay? When we're depleted of that, our mind does not act the same. It cannot, right? So we're, we're trying to find a way to balance these, these areas of our life as best we can. Okay, now there's gonna be lots of crossover. Because if I was to tell you that there's no psychological benefit of, or mental or emotional benefit of exercise, that's a lie, you know that's a lie. This obviously crosses over into every part of our life because we're humans. Our bodies need movement. They need nu nutrition. They need all kinds of stuff. I am terrible at nutrition, right? But I'm pretty good at the exercise one. That one was taught to me early. The nutrition one I'm kind of picking up as I go along. <laughs> so it's gonna take me some time. But exercise, I, I can tell when I need it. And I can tell when I don't get it, right? And when I don't get it, it's because I've chosen not to take it. Like, it's that simple. Because there's always something I can do, right? But sometimes I get in the mindset where it's like, well, if I can't go to the gym for an hour, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> That's like the addict in me, right? Like who says, well, an hour's not long enough. Why don't you just wait till you can go for two hours, right? Let me tell you how often I have two hours to work out. Zero. <laughs> Use, most days I don't have two hours to work out. I have an hour, hour and a half, right? I used to have two hours. Um, before the lockdown happened, I was getting up to about, I could take two hours of cardio and resistance and stuff without my back falling apart, but I'm gonna have to get back there again. So anyway, exercise is about doing something, okay? It's the same exercise if you're talking about mental and emotional, exercise has a similar placement there, right? And it, it just has a place to make us feel better, okay? And part of, for addicts and alcoholics, and even, I, I don't know, the rest of you out there, we like to chase pleasure, right? We like to chase the feeling that exercise gives us. Now, and some of us will take it and go overboard. So can you overtrain? Of course you can. You can overtrain to the point where you start getting hurt every time you start working out, whether it be running, walking, whatever your case may be, if we push it too much, it will end up turning into a defect, right? It'll end up hurting us in the long run. It's much like sex, okay? Sex, Where, what are you doing in terms of sex? Are you having sex? Are you, like, is sex problematic? What is happening there that is either healthy or unhealthy for you? And sex is on its own, fucking great, right? Consenting adults, fucking great. So. That's all good. It's, it's all a part of building up what it is that's going to help us or hurt us, right? So if I'm running around, and like I was for a long time in my life, running around being promiscuous, that's unhealthy because it's, it opens me up to so many different dangers. Not just me, but everyone I come in contact with, right? So it opens us up, so it becomes very high risk if that's one of my coping mechanisms, right? So I'm going to probably suggest even though I use it for full on as a coping mechanism, if I can help you not use it as that, then I will, right? Because this can get just as problematic as drugs or alcohol. And by problematic, I mean deadly, right? Like it can eventually kill us. 
Um, maybe not the act of sex, maybe it's something associated to the sex that kills us. Who knows? Because we're all like, we all like sex in our own way, I think, right? Um, okay, so exercise. It doesn't have to be grandiose. Meditation, same idea. You don't, if you can't sit for 30 minutes, sit for three minutes, right? Like, sit for two minutes. If you can't sit for five minutes, then you might want to try three, right? So in terms of meditation, what are we talking about? Are we talking about like full on, does it have to be like gongs and, and singing bowls and all this stuff that maybe, honestly, I used to scoff at, right? I obviously don't scoff at it anymore because meditation and prayer have absolutely changed my, um, my life. So wherever you start is where you are, okay? You, you don't need to be 30 minutes or you don't do it. But again, it's like exercise, right? If it, we're gonna use our brain games to keep us from doing things that are healthy for us. Like honestly, I find there's way more resistance in me to doing healthy than there is a difficulty of not doing the bad. Like the not doing the bad seems really simple until you realize what you have to do instead, <laughs> right? Or until I realize what I have to do instead to not go back to the bad, right? And that means it's gonna take a little bit of discipline, right? Where, where are we? Are we physically disciplined? Are we mentally disciplined? Are we emotionally disciplined? Are we disciplined in where we go and don't go, right? Like, what is it that our life is made of that's making us either feel like we want to pick up again or putting us in a position where we feel like we want to take our own life, okay? Um, now, we could do all the perfect things, okay? We could do all the things right and still end up at the end of the bottle or the gun, right? Like we can, it can happen like that because the universe doesn't owe us shit, right? It doesn't owe me anything. I am trying to build healthy habits so that I am less of a disaster for everyone around me and for myself, right? That's legitimately what I'm going after is to be less of a disaster and to try to be of use to people instead of hurting them, right? Like that, those are, those are things that I need to be disciplined to do those things, right? Because honestly, I, I slip into selfishness so quick and selfishness gets me isolated. And when I'm isolated, it's dangerous. I might drink or I might try to take my life. Because once I get isolated, all I have is my brain, right? And I've learned long enough that when I'm alone too long, my brain starts acting differently than when I'm surrounded by people who are maybe trying to get well too, right? Who aren't drinking, just like me. Um, around people who are not afraid to look at their own um, lives truthfully and like with um, an open mind. Right? Like those are the people that I am, am around, thank God. But that was purposeful, okay? I, it was purposeful. I spent, a, I took a lot of, um, it took a lot of fear. It took me being very, very insecure, okay? And this is why it took me so long to start doing it, is because I didn't like insecurity. Insecurity feels awful, obviously nobody likes to feel that way. But the reality is, in being insecure never killed me. Trying to avoid it almost killed me a few times, right? So, and I say that with a chuckle, but I mean it. Like, insecurity was just as dangerous to me as anger. Because insecurity made me feel like everybody's against me. Everybody, right? So of course, if I feel that way, I am gonna be less likely to wanna be here, right? So what I've got to do, um, is I've got to build my own, and I say, I have this under physical, but it's also everything, right? What we're talking about here now is about how to address all kinds of things. But if we want to also talk about the mental, let's just put it all together, right? Um, we're going to say, what about a psychiatrist? Okay, maybe you need a psychiatrist, maybe I need one. What about a counselor? Or if you're religious, you can, like your religious leaders, whoever they are. Um, your religious leaders, okay? Um, but again, we want to make sure that there's stuff we trust, people we trust, right? Um, it's, I think it's one of the one of the really strong things about the twelve step fellowships is that is that we're surrounded 
by people like us. And, and for the most part, we are all trying to get better, right? We're going about it different ways for sure. And that's the way it's got to be because we're all a little bit different, right? So seek out some help in terms of that mental, emotional stuff if it goes beyond simply rebalancing physical, okay? And most of the time, it's, it's a combination. We're talking correlation, not causation, right? So there's, these things are all correlated to be either really healthy or the opposite of that, right? It's just the logic that's imprinted in, in those behaviors. If I continue to self-medicate with a toxic chemical that's causing me to uh, do terribly destructive things, then I might want to look at maybe getting on, on a proper medication, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. There's a trade-off with proper medications. They're not as fun, <laughs> okay? They're just not. They're not designed to be fun. Okay? The trouble, the, the truth is, most of them address the symptoms. They don't cure the underlying causation or the, the brain. They cure the symptoms of what's going on, right? In terms of the chemical imbalance, etc. Okay? Or lack of chemicals, whatever it is. So as we get through this list of now, I don't want to stay in the dark too long, right? And you probably noticed that quick transition into solution-focused stuff. It's because we all know the dark full well, okay? We know that this dark is that dark I was talking about earlier that once I'm in it, I have a real hard time getting out of it, right? It's a little bit different now that I'm not drinking, but of course, some like over the holidays, it was awful and it made me feel just like I felt back when I was drinking, right, in between. So it was awful. Um, and it's no wonder some of us go back out because of that those feelings that come up in recovery, right? It's because I was not ready to feel that shitty after living what I've started to believe was a decent life and then to have that feeling of awfulness take me into that dark abyss. And I tell you what, I'm still conf like just baffled by it. But what it does is it reminds me of how complicated we are biologically, right? And that there are legitimate biological reasons why some people relapse and why some people um, attempt suicide and commit suicide, right? There's lots of biological re correlation, I should say. I, I don't mean reasons as in cause. Um, I'm not smart enough to know that stuff. I just know there's correlation. So anyway, we, again, we examine the story we tell ourselves about our bodies, right? Because what's gonna push us to overtrain what if, what if we have some body dysmorphia, like I struggle with? Like, for sure I do. Every time I look in the mirror, I see the same overweight kid that was made fun of. I do. I'm, I'm fucking like 40 years older than that kid. <laughs> but I still see that fucking kid. And then I see the kid at different stages in his childhood when weight and stuff like that was an issue because of what was going on emotionally for that kid, right? Um, things were not good. So of course, by the time I started to get older, I, I don't even know what I look like, really, right? Like, I have no idea. Um, I don't like full, really know, I mean, I, I know what I look like. I, know, I have a theory of mind, thank you very much, if you're out there going, oh my God, I never developed that. I know who I am versus other people and all that stuff, but the reality is I don't really understand how I look. I don't know what I look like to other people. I, I don't fully understand how I look to me, right? So there's, there's all kinds of issues in here. So when I sobered up, overeating became an issue, but I wasn't worried about it because I was overtraining, <laughs> okay? So the two things canceled each other out. And obviously I am now paying for my overtraining because I tell you what, my back, um, after I broke my back there, like it, I'll never be the same. And I fully am aware that I did a lot of that to myself, right? I overtrained when I was out there practicing drinking and stuff. I was like, I used my body like it was a torpedo. Um, so obviously it's not God hating me that I broke my back. It was legitimately bound to happen <laughs> the way I was going, right? Something was going to get broken the way I was going. So anyway, learning to be disciplined, okay? We can start to, to look at our food. How are we eating? What's our relationship like to our food, right? And not that it's going to be always bad, because not, it's not like that, right? But do we need to look at the stories we tell ourselves about that? Do we need to look at the stories we've told ourselves about maybe our mental illness, 
Probably. I know I do, right? I have to, I'll, sometimes it feels like I'm constantly examining what I've heard versus what I'm experiencing, right? Um, what I've read and heard and listened to versus what is actually happening inside. It's very hard to describe it, um, and I totally understand why lots of us have totally different experiences with it, because it's so complicated to describe, right? That place. Um, anyway, okay, so take care of your bodies, right? Take care of your bodies. Um, take care of your mind, because sometimes taking care of your body takes care of your mind. It takes care of your emotional balance. Um, and, you know, when you're taking care of your body, there's this thing that happens. We start to get confidence, right? Just, it's a general confidence. I'm not talking about arrogance where um, we're arrogant and we're superior. I mean like confidence where we make up maybe for that lack of self-worth. And that's what I felt. And that's what I still feel when I go exercise. I feel like there's something happening inside my head. I'm not gonna claim to know exactly what it is, but there's something happening when I exercise that allows me to feel okay about myself for a period of time. I know that sounds really fucking sad, okay? Because as I said it out loud, it made me a bit sad. Um, but it's true, okay? Now as, I, as recovery goes on, I keep putting good, healthy things in my life to try to um, work on that value and that worth without needing to get it in some external way. Because I understand that, you know what, I, like most of us right now, um, we're probably well aware now that this country and all, and all countries can shut down at the drop of a hat, right? And so that means my privileged gym membership, it doesn't matter, that means none of that shit matters, right? And frankly, it doesn't matter. That's why it doesn't matter. It's only illusory, those memberships and all that jazz anyway. But the reality of it is the equipment was taken away so I couldn't work out the way I had been working out, right? It took me six weeks in lockdown to figure out, Dave, you're going to have to get off your fucking ass at some point <laughs> because I was suffering from the lack of exercise and the lack of movement. I was meditating every day, but I was still suffering from that lack of physical connection to the process of recovery, right? So anyway, spiritually, we want to look at what our spiritual life is. Do we have one? Do we want one? Like these are questions that at any point in time we can ask ourselves. Because just because one year you decided you wanted to um, explore one religion or one theory or one this or one that, just because one, one year you did it doesn't mean you can't do it differently the next year. Right? So we want to examine what our values, beliefs, morals, what our expectations are of the world, like, and what our expectations are of the spiritual path, whatever that looks like. Um, what stories no longer serve our spiritual nature? Like, this last couple of years has been incredible for me, and by incredible, it's also been really pain, fucking painful, right? Like, I am, I am coming out of Christianity and I'm coming out like a rocket, right? Like I, once the once the um, the veil was lifted, it was almost like you just running downhill, right? And so, spiritual existence has to evolve, like every other part of us, right? And I honestly, for myself, what what always hamstrung me and continues to hamstring me today is when I get locked into something, okay? If I get locked into this, or I get locked into that, or I get locked into that, and I think there's no other way to live, um, I'm in trouble. I'm in a lot of trouble. Because black and white for me means there's no point to be here, 100%. Because you know what, we're all gonna die here. Who gives a fuck, right? If it's so black and white, who gives a fuck? In my mind, I'm again, I'm not telling you to think that. Heaven forbid if you do. So. What is our spiritual, what are our spiritual needs? Maybe you don't have any, that's totally cool because I'm not suggesting everybody has to have it. The idea is if you don't have it, then what are you going to um, fill yourself with? So then we would go back to other things, right? You don't, you don't have to be interested in a spiritual path to live a better life. I know that from people who I know who live a fine life and they are not spiritual at all. That's perfectly fine. But you gotta go with what works for you. Okay, so if your whole thing is, no, I wanna be an atheist, but I still believe 
it's okay to be in the middle for a while. It's okay to ride it out and say, hey, you know what? Like, these beliefs are, like, very important to me, and I, I really believe them, and it contradicts the fact that I don't necessarily believe in a Christian God, but maybe I'm agnostic, who knows? What's wrong with the middle? You're allowed to pick anytime you want. You can get off the train anytime you want. I know people say, well, the middle's like the fence. Like, you're sitting on the fence, you know, God doesn't like people who don't make decisions. Yeah, and, and I, I say, you know what? If you're reading the Bible, you're absolutely right. That's the way it's read, right? God doesn't like people in the middle. Am I the only one who thinks that's a little fucking weird? <laughs> okay, like, if God didn't want us in the middle, why are we in the middle? Okay, so, again, the theology of it aside, I don't want to get off topic on that because we all know that I can, if you've heard our podcast, you know that I can go off on a tangent. But what is blocking a spiritual path or approach? Is it, is it simply, like in my case, was it a lot of religion that had to be unraveled for me to see I didn't need the religious side? Maybe, right? But what I firmly believe is that if there's a creative energy and force in the universe, that force accepts us however we get there, right? Because we're already there. We, we're not, we don't have to pretend that we need to ascend to some moral high ground in order to attain something after death, right? Like, we're all going to die. <laughs> like, and we're all going to go wherever we go, right? Like, we're going to become whatever we become. And I don't think that, you know, living a pious life, because what I've learned about that pious life, and you can all evaluate this for yourselves, but what I've learned about a pious life is that it's bullshit, right? The, uh, the most pious life oftentimes covers up some things um, in, in that human being that are very contrary to what they say, right? Um, and I think the idea is, is that if we can just simply get in line with what we believe, we'll be fine. So if you don't believe in God, don't believe in God. You don't need a belief in God to not kill yourself, to not drink. You don't need that. Um, you've got to believe in your heart and what you're doing. That's the important part. Because that's where, the, at the end of the day, we're all forced faced with the same thing, right? The mirror, you know? And uh, anyway, I hope this was helpful in some way, this video. I apologize if I just wasted your time, um, but I, I can't not say something. If you're in danger, please reach out. Uh, if you're in danger right now, call 911, please, wherever you happen to be, uh, and whatever that number is. Um, and you know what, like, it's, there's, you're not bad. You're not bad, okay? You're not, un, you're not um, worthless, okay? I, I know that what I'm saying may have absolutely no bearing on you, right? And maybe I'm just saying it into the camera thinking I'm talking to myself, right? Because I kind of am, okay? Uh, all of you take care out there, and if you get a chance to take care of somebody else, you know, give them the best you got. Thank you.